Hello, and welcome to Trash Art's Take. I'm Sam Mason Bell. Uh, this is episode 9 of season 3. Now, usually I'm joined by Jack and Ryan, but today it's just me. We were going to talk about the Oscars, but instead I'm going to give you a little bit of briefing on the Oscars, and then I have an interview with James Edward Newton, who is a filmmaker and film writer. So yeah, the Oscars. Now, personally, I thought it was a pretty amazing kind of um, films that were chosen. Um, it felt like a year that wasn't your traditional Oscar films that were nominated, which was kind of refreshing. A lot of films about a lot of topics that hit us in the last year or so. A lot of films about revolution, a lot of more diverse collection of filmmakers, and yet also some time to recognise some great auteur pieces like Mank. Personally, when it comes to best film, I would love for Judas and the Black Messiah to win, or the Chicago 7. Um, I think these are really important films. Judas was cinematically just absolutely stunning. But the likelihood it's, it's going to be Nomadland. Fortunately, I haven't seen this film yet, but it has won everything. Every award going. Chloe Zhao is such a hot property as a director. Yeah, I think that's the film that's going to definitely win Best Film. As far as the actor and actress go, it's looking most likely to be Chadwick Bosman for Ma Rainey's Black Bottom. Again, a fantastic film. He gives an absolutely brilliant performance. Personally, I think it's a bit of a shame that Deroy Lindo's not in there for the Defy Bloods. Absolutely stunning performance. A lot of people kind of feel the same about that. It is an absolutely brilliant performance. Kerry Mulligan will rightfully win for Promising Young Women, another excellent film that you wouldn't usually get in a very different kind of Oscar year. But she's she's deserved a win for a long time, and this is the film that really has an iconic stance. There are some amazing female performances, but that was the one that truly, like, personally really stood out. The rest of the nominations, uh, usually I'd go into bigger discussion with everyone else about it, but generally it feels like a year where we're going to see a lot of films maybe picking up one or two awards. There's not going to be one film dominating everything, but these are my early views. Again, this is supposed to be a much bigger discussion, uh, so let's move on with the interview. So I got the pleasure to sit down with James Edward Newton and discuss <clears throat> his career. And yeah, it was quite a long discussion. It was good catching up with him. I actually had the pleasure of him interviewing us just before we started doing our own podcast. So yeah, enjoy the interview. I'm on Trash Arts Take with James Edward Newton. How you doing, man? You good? Yeah, really good. Thank you, Sam. And really glad to be here. Yeah, glad to have you on. Just so people know, a couple, I think it was like a year or so ago, you actually came down to Portsmouth and interviewed myself and Jackson. Yeah, I did. Yeah, I mean, uh, we'll, I think we're going to talk a little bit about my podcast, a little further, uh, you know, a little bit further along in, in, in this one. So I can talk a little bit about it more there. Uh, but yeah, I came down. I wanted to do it, you know, face to face. And one of the reasons why I do the podcast is to meet people and broaden my list of contacts. So I saw what you were getting up to. And I thought you'd be a really good uh, guest. And I wanted to find out more about you. So yeah, it was a really good day. Hey, actually, thank you. Yeah, it's nice having you down. So, um, what got you interested in filmmaking? Well, I suppose with 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 um, with everyone who, who who makes films or wants to make films, it, it it comes from a love of cinema. And I suppose I was just really interested. I was a kind of TV, you know, VHS kid. You know, like <laughs> most of my time was spent. If I wasn't out playing football, I was watching videos and uh, watching films and going to jumble sales and getting books about films and you know going to the library and getting books about films and just w reading about film constantly and um, you know learning about all these things that were films that I'd never had the chance to see trying to stay up late to watch stuff on on the telly uh, uh, going to the video shop and seeing all these brilliant fantastic covers that I, I wouldn't get a chance to watch until I was a little bit older so it was, I always found it really kind of um, intoxicating in, in many ways. And uh, I was lucky, my mother saw in the newspaper, the local newspaper, there was a, a kind of local initiative for sh students who wanted to get, you know, young people, not students, who wanted to get interested in making videos on like a Saturday morning. And, um, and it was free. And so she just signed me on to that. And I went to this place in Wolverhampton on a Saturday morning between kind of 10 o'clock in the morning and about 12. And these people were, would, teach us how to make videos and to, uh, how to make animations and that's what's kind of started my filmmaking really I made my first animation when I was 13 um, obviously with a lot of help from, from the organizers and uh, 
it's sort of spiraled from re there really and it's always been something that i've been doing you know constantly i have to say i don't make animations right i just that, that was just the first thing that i did as a stop motion on that little class um but yeah that's how it started it's kind of snowballed from there then i did media at college and then uh, university i was very lucky enough to go to university and uh, i studied filmmaking there and film there and um now I've got to a point where I, I, I teach it. So it's always been there in the background. I've always been a film buff. And uh, yeah, I, and I suppose with anything in life, uh, anything I've liked, I've always wanted to have a go at it myself. Mm. So uh, I, I always like to dip my toe. And, uh, and with film, that was just, some, that was just something that I, that, I, that I started doing. So when you start making a couple of short films, tell us a bit about that. Was, were these like mini dv or dslr kind of short films what time are we talking yeah <laughs> well when when i uh, when i started making videos uh it was um so so for, for on that initiative that saturday morning at the lighthouse in wolverhampton uh it was uh it was old umatic tapes right this is 1980s right this is about 1988 right the, the whole uh. 1980s. <laughs> So it's been going back a long time. And then uh, after that, uh, when I was at college, yeah, there was some Umatic stuff, SVHS, I don't know if it was like an kind of enhanced version of VHS. Then it was like, th there was uh, initial, um, yeah, I, I think even that was before, it was definitely before Mini DV, and it was before uh, even like Video video 8 and Hi8 Video, which was like an early version of um, Mini DV, just came be before Mini DV. But I, the thing that got me into making films on my, my own was I saw in the, in the news, local newspaper again, <laughs> somebody was selling some Super 8 film equipment. Oh, nice. And so I started with that, making films on my own, was, was making things on Super 8. And, and you'd, you know, you'd have your cartridge and then you'd send it off and then Kodak would send back um, a, a, your, your, your film on video, even though I did have a projector and everything, so I could actually do the telecine myself. Um, so that's how I started. And I've, short films, really, have always been. I, I, I like them as experiments, mm. and, I, and I see them almost as sketches, you know, like like sketches for broader ideas or to, or to test things out. Um, I have to say, I don't actually like the short film format all that much. I, I find some people out there are utterly brilliant at making short films. Yeah. They've, re they've really got that short film mindset. Do you know? Do you know what I mean? They make. It, it's, <laughs> Eat, everything works really well. Um, I haven't got that. I'm, I, I don't think. And I, I think I've made some short films that I really enjoy, that I, that, I, that I think are good and work really well as short films. But mostly, I use them as experiments or tests to, to, to think of ideas, or to you know, it, it maybe couldn't make a full feature film, but it's it could uh, make a nice little short experiment. So that's the way I see short films, really, to test ideas. I'm not one of those classic short filmmakers who understands the real, the intricacies and the formats and the, 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 the guidelines of making a short. I just kind of do what I want and, and, and don't make it a feature film, if that makes sense to you, sir. Yeah, that makes total sense, man. I mean, I have the same sort of attitude with short films. I completely respect the craft and people, like you said, there are some amazing short filmmakers out there. But as far as my own craft, I'd rather do a feature and use the short to experiment with something to see if it can work in the future. Did you send yeah. any of uh, the shorts out to festivals? Yeah, I've done that. Uh, um, I mean, I have to, you know, one of the, the things that's always um, that, that I need to work on, I am working on, is my lack of confidence around my filmmaking, really. And, and for every 10 ideas that I have, you know, one maybe I, I get to the point of even writing a script and even then every every 10 of those scripts maybe every one I, I get around to trying to film so I, I think I, I'm not te as, as prolific as what I would like to be I probably make on average one one or two a year um, but um, I'd like to be a bit more um, uh, pr prolific in, in, in that respect um, sorry, I've forgotten the original question. I, I, I was answer. just festivals, just asking you basically, yeah, if you'd had, um, yeah, if you'd sent any films to festivals, really. Yes, that was it. Sorry, sorry, sir. So, so, um, so when I've really liked something that I've done, which isn't that often, then I'll send it to festivals. Yes. Yeah, so, uh, if, if people go to my YouTube page or my Vimeo page, um, they can see films like The Exhibit did okay at a couple of festivals. 
Um, I, I made a film called The Empty, which um, yeah, got into a couple of festivals as well. But a lot of the times, um, I found festival um, submissions quite exhausting in the sense of it's very expensive or it can build, you know, I don't get fun, I mostly fund my films myself. And so once I've done the sh short film, I like to just put them out there and get a reaction and see what people think straight away, rather than waiting and doing the old kind of festival circuit. And so, especially with the cost of festivals, sometimes you think with short films, it's not worth it. Maybe I should have pushed it more, but you, you can send, you, as you'll know yourself, you can send your film off to hundreds of festivals and you'll be, you'll be in a, you know, you'll be in 20% of them if you're lucky, right? Yeah, and, yeah, completely. And, and, and you have to, and, and, and in many ways, I don't know whether, maybe I should, shouldn't say this, but I, I think we all pretty much know that the, that the film festival scene is a bit of a racket in one respect. Mm, you know, definitely. So, you know, you, you, pay, you pay to submit, but you, you know, you're not guaranteed to be in it, which I understand, but that's why they, they encourage so many submissions, because it, it can be a real, every, you know, if they run this once a year, they can make a couple of thousand, a few mm. thousand a year, I think. And so you have to be judicious with where you send it. And so I, I haven't sent my shorts off to as many festivals as maybe I should have done. But a lot of that was just because I wanted to get it out there using YouTube and Vimeo and let people see it. No, that makes sense, man. I, I, I have a similar attitude. Like there are some shorts that I'll try and push out further. But generally speaking, shorts for me, they're made for anthology films. Um, now, you said earlier that you obviously teach film as well. Now, as yep. well as teaching, you have written two books. So let's talk about those two books. Now, the first one was Anarchist Cinema, and the second one was The Mad Max Effect. What made you yep. interested in looking into anarch anarchism and exploitation? Yeah, thank you. Um, so um, when I um, started teaching, I, I was teaching in, in FE, Further Education, so it was mostly practical stuff. But I was, um, I was um, thinking about moving over and to, to do a, a PhD and maybe moving into teaching in universities. And... You know, I was thinking around that time, uh, some I, I I was kind of politically kind of unconscious, really. Uh, and maybe I always have been, maybe I am now. But at the time when I when I started thinking about, about doing this, uh, I, my eyes had been kind of moved towards um, left wing politics, and 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 I found it pretty dissatisfying, to be honest, with the kind of people I was meeting, and that the, the, uh, I, I found it quite, you know, I, I could agree with their policies, but not necessarily the, the, them themselves. And then, but then I moved through that. I, I bumped into people, people who mentioned this idea of anarchism, what that meant, and uh, you know, it was coming at me from a couple of different sides. I had, I had colleagues who, who were interested in the concept, and I didn't really know anything about it. And then I, a little bit of research, and I started reading, and um, and it found like. I wouldn't call myself an, an, an anarchist now necessarily, but it's the closest to where I am politically. And, I, and it okay. found, it, it was really opened my eyes really to think, to, to a way of thinking about the world and a philosophy of life, right? Mm. And, and that of libertarian, left-leaning libertarian philosophy of life really seemed to be the closest I could, um, to, to my own philosophy. And so I started to develop ideas around that. Now I don't like labels, so I don't like to like call myself an anarchist or, or whatever. Um, but it, it, it felt at the time like it was closest to, to, to how I felt about the world. And, um, and I was like, well, where's, how, how does this fit around cinema? I, I don't remember what my initial thought were, was around that and how it, how, how it fitted into film. I, I don't even remember. But I suppose I, I might have typed into a, a, a Google search once, anarchist film, anarchist cinema, and I didn't see much at all. That had come back, and then I, it started to grow that this would, might have been a potential PhD topic, and eventually it was. So that was where the first book came. The first book came from being based on my PhD. It's like a shortened and, and, and sharper and better version of my, my PhD, um, and it looks at the idea of, of film and cinema as a, a way of exploring radical political ideas, mm. but also the way film and cinema can be a rebellious art form in itself. And I started to look at this concept of, well, how, how do we think of cinema as being rebellious? Is it the films on the screen or is it the films, is it the cinema space itself? So the anarchist cinema is really about these different variations around this, the idea of film as a subversive art form, 
the idea of the cinema space as a subversive art form and the way that that power can be translated into you know exploring uh, a more coherent political philosophy like anarchism um, and so the, the book is really an exploration of those ideas and I, I look at uh, various stuff in there. I look at a lot of exploitation films in that I look at the Centrinians films in that I look at uh, more traditional anarchist cinema like um, Jean Vigo and uh, his film Zero de Conduit, French film from the 1930s. And I look at women in prison movies and I look and I also look at kind of grassroots uh, filmmaking today. Hmm. Um, like people making films like yourselves. That was before I'd met you and before I was, I was, I was aware of you. Um, um, and, and, and also kind of um, activist films. And I try and tie all these threads together. And uh, I think it's successful in the sense of I tie the threads together. You know, some people don't necessarily think, <laughs> don't necessarily agree. But uh, it, it made a, a, I made a PhD thesis and a, and a book that, I, that, that at the very least gets my ideas down, right? Now, the, the Max Effects kind of like moves more into the exploitation area. Yeah. And um, I know this is a very long answer, but <laughs> I, 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 that I, that that's out soon. Uh, the Mad Max effect is out, out shortly. It should be out by by Easter or May, I would think. And it's really I look at this idea of Mad Max at the centre of all these different exploitation traditions, both really kind of big and high profile ones like dystopian post apocalyptic cinema, but also even almost grassroots filmmaking as well. So I look at Mad Max, I look at the Mad Max series, I look at the films that came before it, like the Death Race movies, like Death Race 2000, and then I look at the all the, you know, the Mad Max exploitation that comes after post-apocalyptic action films from the 1980s. And I, and I look at the development of those traditions and those exploitation film cycles. And I think one of the things that I, I talk about, you actually, um, Trash Arts and, 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 and yourself, they... I do mention you very briefly in that book because there's a kind of continuum through the Mad Max, through into this kind of grassroots um, filmmaking, through um, uh, Death Run and Michael J. Murphy. Oh, of course, yeah. So, so I look at Death Run, um, which was a really low-budget, uh, post-apocalyptic, 16-millimeter uh, film made in Britain in the 1980s. And a couple of those guys who were involved in the making of that, Michael J. Murphy is now deceased, mm. uh, or Lyndon and Patrick Oliver, who were... Uh, Lovely guys, good friends. <laughs> they were cast members and they were um, um, uh, at, uh, um, Crew, because I think I think all the cast and crew were <laughs> working together on that film, and they've of course gone on to make films. You, they made a film called Fixer, I yes, believe. Yeah, yeah. And and uh, and it was purely coincidentally, actually. I was around the same time you came on my radar, which I don't know how that happened, but I was I, I'd seen Trash Arts. I, I'd emailed Phil Linden and Patrick Oliver to ask them for some insights on making Death One, and it was just purely coincident. Co coincidentally, uh, they emailed me back at the same time as they, that they said they'd been making some films in Portsmouth. Nice. And, uh, they sh and, and he told me, and, he, and, Pat, and Phil Linden sent me a, a link to one of his short films, and then he said he was, he was in this, uh, this film Fixer. Did he help write Fixer, or, or was it just you? Yeah, no, Phil, Phil wrote Fixer. We had the idea a couple of years beforehand, and we wanted to do more with this character that we'd played around with for a short film for Southampton 48 Hour Challenge. And yeah, we just sat down and he wrote this beautiful script with these bigger than life characters. So, so that started out as a short film, that almost an experiment that you were Yeah, extended. pretty much, yeah. <laughs> yeah, fantastic. That's, a, that's a, a really wonderful way of doing it. Yeah, he, he's a really nice guy. They really gave me their time to, to, to answer these, e these, these emails. And, and Phil was also very kind as well. I showed him a film of, of mine that I'd made called Grace that he, uh, that, that he took the time out to watch. It's quite a long, like 48 minutes, and he took the time to watch and, um, and respond to, which was, which was really nice of him. But yeah, and I'd said that, oh, you know, th there's a continuum there. Right. So even and what I, I try and do as an academic in my research is I try and find these continuities and these um, through lines of history and, and, and try almost to make sense of my thoughts through through trying to make connections. And I thought it was really good. It started to come together. The book started to come together when I brought in the work that you'd been doing into the, the, the bigger whole 
and the, the, the bigger wider context of Mad Max. Obviously, so, you, know, you, you know you 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 get mentioned in in a, in a footnote, and, but it's really important that we can see how something like Mad Max um, led to lots of different collaborations that kind of echo. Mm -hmm. uh, throughout the rest of exploitation film history, even into quite small areas, even into you know, even into Portsmouth in the UK, right? You wouldn't think there was a, a direct link, but the sort the sort of is you know, when you when you see the, the ramifications of, of its influence. Um, it's pretty so, amazing, yeah. really, because those those two books um, <clears throat> they kind of perfectly complement each other in a sequel sense. Because, like you said, anarchism cinema is looking at the side away from Hollywood and the grassroots and and yeah, those more exploitation films. Whereas, of course, Mad Max effect is that dystopian cinema, but it's still the kind of thing that if Mad Max actually happened, then we're in that sort of grassroots existence as it is. So it's really yeah. cool that you did these two books. And um, yeah, I'll make sure we get a link on the screen so people can see that. Did that kind of lead you into the attitude you took with your first feature film, Black Lizard Tales? Uh, no, I, uh, not, not really. And I, there's a kind of almost, I think there's bound to be Obvious crossovers yeah. between my, my my film work and my academic work, but I I'm not really in the business of trying to find what those links are. I think I, I, I see filmmaking as an almost uh, subconscious, um, unthinking, uh, reactive, um, you know, almost taking a, a kind of like a emotional response to something. Mm. I suppose the research of book writing is supposed to be an, it's got to be like an intellectual response to something. Now, I'm not the world's greatest intellectual. I find that far more of a stretch than I do being kind of emotional and dealing with, uh, dealing with instinctive reactions. But um, all of it, both the filmmaking and the research, is about working through ideas. Now, I don't, sometimes when I look at what I've written, the books or what I've made for the films, I would do everything differently again. It's like I, I learn by doing. Yeah, yeah. And does that make sense? I know, I know I'm pretty sure you're, you're, you're the same because you, you, you make the films at such a such a pace and such a clip. Um, and I think, so I think if there's anything that's similarity between Black Lizard Tales and the, and the academic work that I'm doing, it would only be in the process of, I need to make a film. What are my ideas? I'm gonna work out how to do this as I'm, as I'm producing it, you know? Yeah, and yeah. I've made a couple of feature length films before that I hadn't, hadn't showed anyone that, I, that, that were okay but um, were, were, were experiments and they were a long time ago and um, maybe elements of them I was a bit embarrassed by. Um, but I thought now's the time to really kind of get over that embarrassment. One of the reasons, it's actually interesting, uh, Sam, because one of the reasons why I did want to talk to you and I didn't want to do the podcast with you was um, because of the, the, the sheer amount of films that you make. And I think one of the questions that I asked you was about how do you overcome that that inertia or fear of, of reaction or, or, or fear of, you know, the perfectionism. Yeah, yeah. Right? And so that's what I'm trying to overcome. And I just got to look, look, I'm getting on and I need to, you know, it, I need to make this, I need to make a movie. So one of the things I did was, you know, right, whatever happens now, I'm going to take this to completion. I don't care if it doesn't hit my expectations. I'm going to show people this film and really use it as a way of blowing the cobwebs off because I hadn't made a film for a couple of years before that. Um, and so I thought, you know, uh, I want to make a horror film. I want to, you know, I, I want to explore some con concepts and some ideas. Um, and I had this dream. I was having a couple of various dreams came to me of different disconnected ideas. And Black Lizard Tales is a sort of. It's not really an anthology, it's, but it's a. It's got three different parts with, where we'd see the similar events from from different characters' perspectives. Right, but they can all the three different parts can work as different short films on their on their own. Mm. But it's quite it's quite <clears throat> the, the, the connections between them are quite uh, illogical. <clears throat> Excuse me, they're, they're illogical connections. The film makes sense in terms of its own internal logic, but not necessarily is it fully coherent. Okay. Right, and I and I and I quite like that about it. Uh, it, it, it no film is perfect, but it, in terms of the ethos and the mood, it hit what I wanted to hit. You know, I, I've got a couple of quotes that, if you don't mind me reading out, that I, that when I had my notebook, um, when I when I was making Black Lizard Tales, I put everything in a notebook and all my all my kind of script notes and my um, organisational notes that I kind of carry around me, kind of little directors, um, like. Uh, 
book really to kind of help me make the film. And at the front of it, I've got these quotes to try and inspire me, to, to kind of remind me of what, my, what I'm trying to achieve here. The first one was uh, uh, from Dario Argento. It says, you must push everything to the absolute limit or else life will be boring. And I thought, nice. well, that's what I'm going to do with this film, right? It's going to be over the top. It's going to be mad. It's going to be, I'm going to try not to hold back in terms of the, the, how illogic it is and how dreamlike it might be. Don't try and always try and let it make sense. If it's violent, make it as violent as you can make it. You know, if it's got kind of sexual scenes, it can be as, um, uh, you know, it, it can be as outrageous as you want it to be. And so I tried to push everything to the limit in, in, in the making of it. The second quote was from um, the um, Mick Jagger uh, uh, character in the film Performance um, uh. by um, uh, Nicholas Rogue. And he says, the only performance that makes it that really makes it, that makes it all the way, is the one that achieves madness. And that was another thing. <laughs> I wanted to kind of achieve some level of madness with this film. And the final quote, uh, and, and for uh, for our next book, was uh, from a, a review of Martin Scorsese's *The Last Temptation of Christ*. And he say, and he calls it a, a truly terrible and totally deranged piece of work. Now, obviously, that is a that is like a critical quote, right? It's criticizing yeah. that. But I thought. God, I'd love to make a film that's truly terrible and a truly deranged piece of work, you know? And so I was aiming for that as well. And I, and I think Black Lizard Tales, it's got its moments of real, de it's deranged in places, and I, and I like that about it. You, um, you also worked with uh, Tony Marden on um, <clears throat> Black Lizard Tales, who's yeah. absolutely lovely guy. I mean, I've not met him in person, but I've chatted to him enough. And of course, yeah. he's a Ted Lasso legend, so, you know. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely, and that was another co coincidence, right? <laughs> right. So it was just again, it's like these people who are making. There's a real, um, there's a real scene, I think, yeah. in Britain of people making horror and surreal and mad feature films that are kind of under the, very much under the radar. You know, made and making them again. We use the phrase grassroots, almost homemade. But making them quickly, and there's a, there's a lot of, kind of crossover with the cast and the crew members. You, you guys are at the part of it. In many ways, you're, you're, you're at the centre of it. And that was one of those coincidences. When I put the call out for casting for Black Lizard Tales, I noticed several people, several actors, who'd worked with um, Andrew Jones, who, who, who's a, a, another prolific filmmaker who's making films like the Halloween Jack movies and the Robert the Doll movies, um, and um, lo lots of other kind of... Um, um, exploitation films, British exploitation films. I noticed some guys in that had responded to my casting call. But Tony was one of them, and he was local to me, and he's a really nice guy. He really goes all out. Um, <laughs> we had him in this film, you know, covered in blood. I was pretty much pouring blood directly down his throat for him to spit out. And <laughs> at one point, he did like a two-minute, a, a two-minute take uh, in close of him dying. Um, a really long, kind of slow, painful death, and uh, he was he was up for it, covered in all sorts. And uh, you, really, I really couldn't ask for a man who was more uh, committed and lovely, and uh, who understood what needed to be done at this level. Mm. Do you know what I mean? And you yeah. know, you know from your cast. I mean, you you used a lot of the casts over and over again, presumably for that reason, because they know exactly what it is. You know, you can get something out of them. They know what it is. That needs to be done when you're making films with no budgets, you know. Yeah, to some degree. I mean, I like to cast um, actors we worked with over and over again to give them a different character, so they've got something new to be able to showcase, and I get to do something different with them. And yeah, they are familiar with our filmmaking style. Plus, they they tend to become good friends who you want to try and forward at the same time. And at some point, I, I do want to be able to work with Tony. Um, this kind of led towards obviously then the Newton Talks podcast. With, yeah. um, which kind of makes so much sense now that you've been talking a lot about grassroots as to why you set up an indie film podcast. Yeah, absolutely. I, I um, you know, I, I've been thinking about doing a podcast for for a while purely because I've got the I've got the means, and you know, a lot of people seem to have them. Hmm. Also, I've got my my, my website. It's just a, it's a WordPress site, and I, and I thought, oh, great, blogging, get my ideas down. I'll do a bit of blogging. I'll do a film review here. I'll write about my thoughts here. And really, I, I, I find it difficult to get myself around to typing something and writing something. I'm writing stuff all the day. It's not, you know, I'm emailing all the time because I'm 
of my job and I'm writing lectures all the time. It's hard then to just go to, to write in some, you know, blogging, right? Mm. And, and so I thought, well, maybe the podcast could kind of almost take the, take the place of that. So the Newton Talks podcast, initially it was just, I know a lot of people who are filmmakers, academics, authors, artists. I thought I could get some interesting conversations going. Uh, that was the first thing. I knew a lot of people who, who would make interesting conversations who, who uh, that I would like to listen to. Um, it was a way of um, getting out ideas quite quickly by just talking and you know just and then posting them, being able to post them to for people to listen to. So that was always really exciting and really energising. Um, but also it, it gave me an opportunity to increase my contacts and my network. Mm. You know, to speak to you guys. I spoke to Andrew Jones. I've spoken to academics and other filmmakers who I've never spoken to before. And, and it, it's a really good way of, of building up in-depth professional networks, right? And um, as well as friendship networks. Yeah. So if nothing else, it's really good for that, you know? And if you're having these really interesting conversations because you know filmmakers and you know artists and you know academics, why not record it? <laughs> right? Yeah, you know, no, no, I completely agree. That's why we're doing this. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So, because you know, you you're having these conversations all the time anyway. So why not record them? Because some, you know, sometimes some real gold comes out. And I've also got that within that the kind of microcast strand as well, the cult film microcast strand, where I talk for about five to ten minutes on a single individual cult film, which is really fun to do as well. Which nice. just enables me to just throw my thoughts out uh, around these films and try and take it, get a little bit of a different take on some of these movies than has previously been considered. But all of it is a, is a better way for me than, than just doing a traditional blog. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, uh, definitely. It's going to be a bit laborious. I love reading blogs. I love reading people's film blogs. Uh, but it's, um, I, I found it difficult to, to get motivated and do. So Newton Talks have been a lot of fun. And um, yeah, there's more, there's more coming. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's really good. And it's, it's good to see it's get, it, get list, it gets some listens as well. You know, not massive numbers, but pretty consistent. That's good. So I think there's a kind of core of people who seem to listen to it and seem to respond to it, um, which is which is really exciting. I've had some really nice feedback. So what's what's next for you? Are you working on any films right now, or is it more just waiting for this year to do its thing? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm I'm um, I've, I've I'm always working on stuff, always writing. So at the moment, I've got two feature scripts on the go: one with a view to filming myself. Excellent. And one with a film view to it's a bit more more ambitious. So maybe maybe try and get some funding or just be a kind of calling card script. Uh, we've got short films that are ready to go. Uh, we don't make films as kind of quickly as you guys, um, but that's a kind of real. Uh, I'm always excited by that idea of being prolific. So there's the guy. Um, he made a lot of. He's a kind of Hollywood figure now. Joe Joe, Joe Swanberg. He made a lot of mumblecore films. In the oh 40s. yeah. yeah. I mean, we're just, I mean, you made, at one point you made 12 feature films in like uh, six years, right? I mean, just absolutely fantastic stuff, really low key stuff. He, he acts in most of them. So inspiring, you know, uh, and, I, and I wish, almost wish to kind of get to that, that level or your level of, 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 of the way that the sheer amount that you can make. So we've got, I will, my intention is to make a feature film this year. Initially it was to make two, but I think I'm only going to be able to make one realistically this year. I'd like to, um, again, that will be a kind of it, 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 the script I'm writing at the moment is a sort of horror-ish, surreal kind of crime film. Nice. Um, um, uh, that's the only way. That's all I can describe it at the moment. It's in its very early stages. Whether that becomes the one that we end up doing, I'm not sure. But that's what I'm writing at the moment. Uh, there's a short film we've got ready to go where the cast and the locations are all in place. We just need. To, locked down to ease a little bit and that's something that we can make and after that i want i'll probably try and make two feature films next year a kind of more ambitious one that takes a little bit longer but i've also got this um ambition to to make to, to increase the speed at which i make films so to make the, make a film in a week or make 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 a feature film in a night i know you made a feature film in a night uh which was which is which is fantastic you know what was that that was the drug the tour. drug tours yes <laughs> that's I, mean, great. I think that was one of your early ones and you know, you, you've just got to come up with a concept. And there's all these people now making feature films in an, in an evening. I love the idea of making a film that's almost like a stage play where you spend a couple of you know, weeks rehearsing and then you know, film it in one take. Yeah. That, that, I, love, I love that kind of low-key, single-location mo movie stuff. You know, like, uh, I think that's, that's really inspiring. So this year, at least one short 
and one feature film. Uh, and then next year, hopefully two feature films a year. That's Excellent. the point. That's the plan. Nice. I'm going to ask you my question that I ask everyone when we wrap things up. If you yep. had an infinite budget or is there a particular franchise or story you'd want to tell, what's your dream project? Yeah, thank you. It's a really good question. My mind changes so quickly that by the time I say this, by the time this goes out, it, it'll, it'll have changed the game. But I did write a couple of notes down because I knew I'd forget. <laughs> and uh, I've always been, uh, for, for a number of reasons, I've always been a real fan of uh, uh, like Jesus films, right? Like Last Temptation of Christ, uh, uh, The Passion of the Christ by Mel Gibson. I think these films are really what I've, so I've always thought, you know, because it's a, a kind of perennial story, uh, what would my take on one of the gospel stories be? That's a bit odd, I think, to come, you know, and I don't want to get into all the reasons why I might want to do that. But it's, I, I've always, I love the imagery and I'd love to play around with that, that, that concept and, and, and take that concept of, uh, of, of taking one of the, the Bible stories, particularly one of the Gospels. But also there's the 60s and early 70s uh, spy series canon with Edward Woodward, which had a feature film in the 1970s, but uh, I think could do with a revival. I'd love to make a film of the canon series. He's a real kind of dour, kind of down to earth um, uh, assassin. Um, yeah. For a British kind of department spy agency, and it's really kind of like uh, existential um, stuff. If you ever get a chance to to, to watch Callum, it, it's really really good uh, uh, kind of dirty kind of like um, exploration of, a, of, a, of, a, of an assassin. Um, so that's good. I've always been interested in a film about cults. I'd like to make a film about um, the, the Heaven's Gate cult or uh, the, the the Jonestown massacre. Mm. Um, I think that's you know really horrifying stories, but stories that really tell us something about humanity. So I've always been interested in that. And other than that, the only other franchise that I really like to make a film for is, of course, which I'm sure everyone would, would be uh, the James Bond franchise. <laughs> every that's British person, every British man says they want to take a chance of Bond. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so obviously, that's a very long way off, but it's uh, <laughs> coming from making films on video, right? For for, for nothing. <laughs> But um, but you know I'm a I'm a big fan of James Bond as well. I love the I love the kind of that the, the pulpiness of Bond as well, particularly. And uh, so who who wouldn't want to do that? Does that answer your question, Sam? So I'll give you about four different answers. <laughs> no, it's awesome. I love asking that question because some people will be restrained into that. Well, if I had a budget, I could do this. And it's like, yeah, well, let's just dream for a second. Yeah, right. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us, James. I will make sure to put all your links on the screen and in the description. And yeah, hopefully you can join us for because we do like uh, roundtable discussions on certain film subjects. So I'd love to get you down for one of those chats at some point. That would be fantastic, Sam. I'd absolutely, I'd absolutely love to do that. I, I, I really, I like to, you know, to, I like to, I'd like to, you know, talk to all you guys. I'd like to uh, get involved in any kind of discussion on film. I think that would be really inspiring and, and and really fun. And I've really enjoyed today. And I really thank you for asking me. More than welcome, man. I hope you have a good day. I hope you do too. So yeah, that was the interview. Don't worry, next week it won't be as awkward of me trying to fill time with my own voice. Uh, there'll also be, of course, Ryan and Jackson. And we'll be joined by Jessica Hunt to talk about dreams and nightmares within films. So please like, subscribe, cling that little uh, alarm. Check out trasharts.co.uk. Check us out on all the social, inst the social medias. And yeah, bye-bye. <laughs>